Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host. Great privilege to join you tonight. I hope you had a good St. Valentine's Day. You know, we always think about that day as being a day of sending cards and candy, and, and that's, of course, a wonderful tradition. But the, the real purpose of St. Valentine's Day was to remember the martyrs whose name were Valentine, who uh, gave their life in defense of the faith, how important the faith was. And to a certain extent, the journey home is about our guests sharing how important the faith is to them uh, in their love for Jesus Christ and then discovering the beauty of the church. And for some, that journey, well, isn't a red martyrdom, but for some it can be a real challenge because of, of what they face in that journey coming from a, one tradition to a completely different. And that might be a little, we'll find out in a moment if that's the truth about our guest tonight. Our guest is April Bright. She joins us from Oregon and she's a former United Pentecostal. April, welcome to The Journey Thank Home. Thank you, Marcus. It's good to have you here. Thank you, it's good to be here. And uh, anxious to, I mentioned United Pentecostal and I'm anxious to hear about your journey because I know that uh, I'm assuming a lot of our guests are familiar with the United Pentecostals in their town, but maybe know very little about their beliefs and, and often because their form of worship is a bit different. We, we mm -hmm. just don't understand so but i'll get out of the way and invite <laughs> you to start from the beginning and let's hear your journey all right well the the church is technically called the united pentecostal church international so I'd, i'm just going to call it upc or upci because it's a long name okay. um they're they came out of the pentecostal movement in the early 20th century and i think it was about 1916 they had a, a split with the assemblies of god yeah. over the issue of the trinity so the you know, the UPC is uh, Oneness Pentecostal. And what that means is basically that they believe that God is one, like we do, uh, but God is not three in one, but one in one. And it's a kind of a confusing concept if you, you know, yeah. if you've grown up with Trinitarian, kind of like the Trinity was confusing for me before that. But um, I think the way that it's been easiest for me to explain it to people is uh, so. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are titles of God. They're modes yep, okay. of being. Um, and it would be the same as you're one person, your name is Marcus, God's one person, his name is Jesus. You're a father, a son, and a spouse. Those are modes of being Marcus, they're manifestations. Um, but they're not yep. different people. You know, you don't relate to your mother the same as you relate to your wife. So that's, I think, the easiest way to try to understand it. And it, it, a couple things. When you have a movement like the Azusa Street movement, mm -hmm. which led to the Pentecostals, so um, many of them were not converts from nothing. They were coming from other traditions mm -hmm. that had experienced this awakening of the Spirit. Yes. All right. Well, that also involved how much of the past do we keep? Right. And so the Trinity is a good example of, well, show it to me in the Bible. Yes. And so since the word Trinity isn't in the Bible, mm -hmm. and you have a lot of different expressions of the relationship between Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you have different teachers guided by the Spirit trying to understand mm -hmm. what they're, and that's really what it comes to. I don't want to be critical of the movement yet as we're just starting <laughs> the story, but, but again, when, when you, if you, you take tradition, Mm -hmm. in the church and you set it aside and all I've got is the Bible and the Holy Spirit guiding me, you're going to end up with problems, yeah. which is exactly what happened in that movement. And another thing is that when you uh, jettison history, right, mm -hmm. and you're looking at Azusa Street in 19, I think it was 11 or whatever mm -hmm. it was, and, uh, and the awakening of this, and you kind of jettison all of history, you forget that modalism was already around back in the yeah. fourth century or third exactly. century that they already tried it back then and the church said man that doesn't really explain god but we won't i'm jumping ahead <laughs> of ourselves yeah so there's the background of what you were in now were you born into that uh my parents got involved with it when i was about two so basically i mean my earliest memories are my mom teaching me about god teaching me about prayer uh you know telling me you can tell God anything. He's always there with you. Uh, you know, you can pray to Jesus just like he's your best friend. And so I did from my earliest childhood. I, I thought it was great. I thought it was the best thing ever. I have this God who loves me and he's here with me all the time. It was like the ultimate, uh, you know, 
make-believe friend, except for I knew he wasn't make-believe. And so from the very earliest times, I had a very close relationship with Jesus, and I told him everything. And I was an only child for a long time, so uh, I spent a lot of time, you know, we'd go places and I'd tell him my joys and my fears and my sadness, you know, anything, everything. So, um, and we would have, you know, like three services a week and they were fairly long as some of the, these movements tend to be, you know, so I was probably the only four year old that was sitting in the pew paying attention to what the, the pastor had to say. I thought it was amazing and fantastic. Um, now a couple things. So the, the kind of worship was, it, <clears throat> I don't know the absolute details of United mm -hmm. Pentecostalism, but it, is it one that the, the signs of tongues and such were yes, necessary? Yes, so they, um, obviously the Trinity is the biggest difference between right. us, but they actually hold some beliefs that are more similar to ours. So they do not believe once saved, always saved. You okay. can lose your salvation. Um, they do believe that baptism is necessary for salvation, which a lot of Protestants right. don't. Right. Um, and they do believe in tongues as being necessary for salvation. And it's something that is so important and such a large part of their life that you could ask anybody, when were you saved? And they'll tell you date, time, and place where they first spoke in tongues. Okay. So it is a right. very big part of it. And again, what you see is certain scriptures being raised up as the definiting definition of, of who they are and, mm -hmm. and their faith. Yeah. And often it's because that's what the leader's experience was. And so this is, this is what's important. This mm -hmm. But as a little child, I mean, was that emphasized until you were later until? Uh, it, it was. I mean, when, when you pray in church, I mean, you'd have like altar calls, but not, not like the evangelical come up and get saved, but just come up and pray. Right. Um, and people come and pray around you and they pray for you to get the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues right. and, you know, um, they tend to say Holy Ghost, but uh, it's, it's a very big deal. You know, they want it for everybody because right. they want everybody to be saved. And so, yeah, well, yeah. there we, there's the good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you've just enumerated an awful lot of things that are parallel to our own faith. Mm -hmm. We want our children to have that same love for Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, and dedication to prayer and wanting everyone to be saved. And we, that's, praise God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was great. Um, yeah, so I, I loved it. I went with my parents weekly, you know. I, when I was about probably six, uh, I remember a pastor giving a sermon about the wisdom of Solomon and about, you know, him praying for wisdom to lead his people correctly. And, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and then the story of knowing who the mother was of the baby, and, and I thought he was the most amazing man. Of course, the sermon didn't include his fall from grace, but <laughs> he was my hero for years, you know, and I went home and I prayed. I said, God, I want that wisdom. I want the wisdom to follow you wherever it leads me. I don't know where it will, but um, I honestly believe that's part of the reason that I'm here today, because at that young age, I really wanted to follow God anywhere, even though I didn't know where it would be. You wanted the understanding and the wisdom to know his, his guidance and his exactly. will. Exactly. Did it did it protect you as a young woman, through as you as you grew? Did was it did it was it a conviction that yeah. was strong for you? Yeah, I think so. It definitely it was. Um, uh, you know, as I got a little bit older, uh, I mean, when you're six, you can't really completely understand that prayer, you know. But as I got older, um, it became more important to me you know, thinking about where I had come from and, and what it meant truly to follow God. And in, in the UPC, um, missionary work is, is kind of a big deal. And I thought at first when I was real young, you know, maybe I'll be a missionary someday. <laughs> uh, but Some traditions like the Baptist tradition, when you get of age, you're expected to be baptized in the mm -hmm. baptized tradition or confirmed? Is there a, is there a rite of passage like that? In the well, it's not so much a specific age or, you know, not necessarily a rite of passage. I think speaking in tongues is more of a rite of passage, right. but um, it's usually up to the parents and the specific preacher, and they kind of decide when the child is ready, when they feel like the child is, uh, you know, has gotten to the age of reason. Okay. So... So, so did that happened. It did. I was <laughs> uh, I was I think about seven or eight, and then I was baptized. I, I remember I bugged my mom for a long time. I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized. You know, um, 
because baptism is necessary for salvation. And I was like, well, what happens if I don't get baptized, Mom? So uh, eventually they decided that I was ready and they let me be baptized. Now, when you're of age, is the, are you also being prayed to speak in tongues mm -hmm. at that yeah, time? Yeah, after you've been baptized, they really um, emphasize, you know, pray to receive this. And, and so eventually, you know, my mom said that I spoke in tongues. I don't remember it. I mean, I was pretty young, so, yeah. right. um, but it could have right. happened. <laughs> All right. And so after, at some point after I was baptized, uh, you know, as I s did get to the age of reason, um, I started having a lot of issues with the interpretation of scripture. And I remember when I was really young saying to my mom, but that's not what it says when we would go to church, you know, and, and mostly it was over the issue of the Trinity. Yeah. <laughs> and my poor mother, she she didn't really know what to say to me or where it was coming from. And she probably didn't completely take it seriously because I was a kid. What does, a, you know, an eight year old know about scripture, right? Um, but it, it really bugged me, you know, and there were a lot of verses yeah. in scripture that, that I just, I would go home and I would say that that's just not right, you know? Um, it, yeah. We just had the baptism of Jesus uh, this morning, and, feast, right. or yesterday morning, and that was one of them, you know. I mean, he's baptized, his father's voice comes, yes. and the dove descends, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, you know. And That's then right. uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying to his father, and I'd, I would say, but who's he praying to? He's <laughs> not praying to himself, I mean, you know, and, and the... Yeah. I would get answers from people and they would be things like, well, you know, it's his flesh crying out because nobody wants to be crucified, obviously, but, but maybe it was because I was young, but it didn't really make sense to my young mind. And I'd say, well, I don't cry out to myself. I don't, you know, I mean, my body doesn't say to me, April, I'm hungry, feed me, you know? So I couldn't really reconcile the two and I couldn't understand how God could be one in the, the way that they teach, but yeah. I didn't know any other way. I had no idea. What even other Christians believe? Yeah, I had never heard of the Trinity. You know, this morning I, I was just thinking of a verse I read this morning uh, in John 17 in his great priestly prayer, where our Lord Jesus is praying to the Father, and he's praying that the disciples will be one as they are one. Mm -hmm. Well, he's talking to the Father. Well, if their oneness is just a mode, mm -hmm. well, then what does that mean for Christians? Are we just modes of one another? Or, yeah, you know, it's the, the parallels get funny mm -hmm. when you, and that's why the early church looked at this idea and said, no, of course not. That's not. Uh, and part of it is is our own reason. You know, how do we deal with three and one? It yeah. is a tough thing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and my guess is, as a young girl, you were confronted with that. Well, mm -hmm. how does three and one make sense? Well, I had never heard of the Trinity, so I didn't have oh. that idea in my head. Um, I think I had heard from people that there were people who claimed to be Christians that believed in three gods. And I, I don't know if they were re necessarily referring to Trinitarians or sometimes, yeah. uh, you know, other faiths. But um, I just felt like there was something more not necessarily different, just more. And I just didn't have any idea what it might be. But I prayed a lot about it. Um, and I quit asking people to explain to me because they couldn't really figure out what I was talking about and you know. Uh, but I, I prayed about it a lot. And I felt like God told me, you know, you'll, you just keep seeking me and you'll find what you're looking for eventually and you'll know it when you find it. And so I was like, okay, God, I, you know, I can do that, I think. <laughs> um, but it was not something that I could figure out on my own. Right. You know, right. even with the scripture there, I just knew that was something. So you, you, you quit pressing your mother on that. Yeah. Did, they, did the leaders of the church get involved at all? Or did you just not um, go that quite that far to get them to answer your question for you? You know, I think that they tried once or twice, uh, but I didn't want to push it too far. You know, I did. I realized that it annoyed people or, or confused <laughs> them or, you know, whatever <laughs> it was. Um, and so I figured, eh, you know, I can just pray and Jesus is my best friend, so <laughs> it'll be fine. 
<laughs> so uh, I mostly, you know, just kind of kept it to myself after that. Um, and then by the time that I was, I would say about 12, 11 or 12, I decided that I really didn't want to be a part of this faith anymore because there was something that I felt like was missing. And I felt like I was pretending basically. And, and part of that probably comes from the young age that I was, you know, I, I wish I had um, heard Jose Maria Escriva say, do what your parents tell you while you're a child. <laughs> but I hadn't heard that yet. So, you know, I felt like I just, I'm pretending and it's not there because I know there's something more and whatever it is, I want it. Oh. So um, my dad quit going around the time I was 12. And I said, well, if he doesn't have to go, I don't have to go which, you know, parents don't really like to hear, but they ended up saying, okay, well, well I sadly, guess that's that happened fair. all over the place, you know, when, well, yeah. I, my own experience is my father did a similar thing. He kind of went there when I was young, but when I got later, he just quit. Mm -hmm. And uh, said, so I yeah. know the experience. Yeah, yeah so I... Um, so you quit going, but, quit going. but your best friend Jesus didn't leave you, right? No, I, at that time, you know, I thought, well, I have my Bible <laughs> and I have Jesus, so what more do I need? <laughs> so I, I read my Bible a lot and I, I spent a lot of time in prayer and uh, I didn't really do any research as far as other faiths until I was in my later teens because, you know, it was, you can't really do that when you're 12, you know. Um, but then when I got older and I, uh, I got the, the internet and, you know, I could kind of research those things without even having to go, I started researching on my own and um, I researched like every denomination I had ever heard of, Protestant only. Um, I grew up in Utah and never occurred to me to look at Catholicism or, you know, even Orthodoxy because there are very few Catholics in Utah and it just wasn't on my radar. It more of a temptation to look at Mormonism. Yeah. There you are surrounded by that. Yeah, right? and especially then. But yeah. Um, yeah, I just didn't even ever think of it. So um, I would research a denomination and learn all about it. And I'd say, nope, that's not the one I'm looking for. <laughs> and move on to the next one. And Was it usually a doctrine that turned you off? Or yeah, it that? was. So I would, um, I had some family that was uh, extended family that was Baptist and I thought oh well, I'll look at the Baptist church you know and then I, I found out that they believed once saved always saved and didn't believe that baptism was necessary and I said no I, I can't do that it's yeah. just that's not what I'm looking for it's not right yeah. um, I, I was convinced that when I found it I would know it and so I didn't worry too much about that you know and so I researched a bunch of them and and I'd like a lot of what I heard about them but then at some point no I just I can't do it you know was it because in your gut it wasn't right or yeah. because of what you saw in scripture or both and? Right? Probably both and. I yeah. mean, I felt like um, I was trusting in Jesus to lead me to whatever it was that he had for me. And I didn't know what it was, but I felt like he'd give me that knowledge in my gut, you know, when <laughs> I had found it. <laughs> so we well, you know what amazes me, and I'm, I'm guessing that a few in our audience are amazed too, is that this was all happening at such a young age. <laughs> yeah. I'm used to hearing this from people who are in their 20s, but not a 12, 13 year old girl. I mean, that's pretty amazing of the work of the Spirit in you to yeah. draw you home to, to our Lord. You know? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I guess it is kind of uncommon, um, but yeah, the Holy Spirit can do amazing things. Right. right. <laughs> So you go through the whole list of denominations? Go through the whole list, everything I'd heard of. I mean, you know, I hear there's like 30,000 now, so not that many, <laughs> but you know, all the major ones. Right. Um, and just every time I was like, no, oh, that sounds good. Oh, no, you know, and I just, every single one couldn't do it. And so eventually I just kind of got to the point where I was like, well, I've looked at everything. I don't know. And maybe there's one I haven't found or maybe it's just not the right time. So I guess I'll just kind of set it aside for a while and kind of, you know, go on and, and just wait. So I um, was kind of in that holding period for probably a good 15 years. Wow. But wow. when I got to... Well, let me, during those 15, was it dry or was there still Jesus? Was there still prayer? Was there, there was still a lot of prayer. Um, and still, I was very close to Jesus. Um, I, you know, when I got to my mid-20s, 
I waited a little while before I went to college, but when I, when I got to my mid-20s and I went to a secular university and I dated an atheist for about four and a half years, <laughs> eventually my faith took a little bit of a hit and I kind of drifted away oh. from God. And I don't think I really realized, you know, what was happening. Hmm. It just kind of, I think I grew complacent, yeah. you know. Um, but also, when, you, when someone's so close to you who has yeah. no faith, was he a... To me, a difference between the atheist and an agnostic is that an atheist, it, oh, it, that's almost a new religion for him, is to not be about God. Was that the way he was like? Or? Yeah, he he um, didn't, he just was like, "There's how could you believe that, really? Mm. You know, and the funny thing was, by the time we ended up breaking up, he told me that he wanted to know Jesus. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I guess I had some sort of an influence on him, and I don't know whatever happened, but... Um, right. It was, it was interesting. And um, I remember, you know, being about 24 and thinking, how could anybody not believe in God? Like yeah. I would look at the trees and the grass and the blue sky. And just to me, he was everywhere, yeah. everywhere. I just couldn't see it any other way, you know? Which um, is a gift of grace. Yeah, it really was. And then, you know, after going to a secular university and hearing all my professors talk about because, uh, you know, sometimes they get a little carried away and they're like, well, people who believe in God, you know. And after four years of that, I think I, I kind of, and, and without like trying to protect myself against it because it didn't yep. occur to me, you know. Um, eventually, I got to the point where I think I started to doubt God's existence. And... I, di I didn't really notice that that was even happening, you know, but uh, I began to have thoughts like, well, what if, what if, what if there wasn't a God, you know, and I'd still be praying. So it was kind of a, an odd time in my life, I guess, because I still had this relationship with Jesus. But then I was like, well, what if I'm imagining things? Because it had never even occurred to me before. You know, and so I think in some ways it was grace because I did get to to question and say, you know, what if, and then get past it eventually, which we'll get to that, but um, which eventually ended up making my faith stronger. Yeah. So. It reminds me of that great movie, It's a Wonderful Life, when he gets to that point of wondering what it'd be like if he never lived, mm -hmm. and then he comes up realizing how grateful he is to have lived mm -hmm. as a result of experiencing life with, you know, not living. And so you're, it's like you were given the grace to imagine what life was like without God and yeah. come back stronger. Yeah, it was, um, <laughs> it was kind of weird when I finally realized that I was having these doubts because it really freaked me out. It, it was <laughs> kind of a scary thought, you know, um, and I didn't really know what to do with it. Uh, in hindsight, I think it was the best thing that, that could have happened, but um, at, at the time, I didn't really think that. So when you when you came back to faith, was it a, a church that helped you come back, or did you end up ever exploring back to the United Pentecostals at all? Or? No, I never did go back to the UPC. Um, it was interesting. So what what actually happened was uh, I was in close to the end of my last year in college, and it was. Uh, right before spring break, and it was, it was probably finals week, but I was on the bus going home one day, and um, it was middle of the day. There was me on the bus and two guys, one in the front, one in the back, and I was in the middle on the left side, you know. And I was listening to my iPod. I was just totally zoned out, not thinking about anything in particular. And all of a sudden, like, I heard a voice kind of, you know, in my head, like God was speaking to me, and he said to me, your soul is in grave danger. And for a split second, I thought, you know, somebody is messing with me. <laughs> and I looked and, you know, the guys were asleep there on the bus. It was a long bus ride. And then I realized, and I kind of, in my mind's eye, saw like a vision, like, this is your life. This is where you are. You're on this road and now you've come to a crossroads mm. and you have to make a decision. And it was, this is the way you're going. And if you keep going this way, this is where you are going to end up or could end up. And if you change your life, you know, this is where you're, you can end up. And it was basically, you know, heaven and hell. And, um, and it wasn't, you know, it was just kind of this thing in my head. And, and basically it was, 
God says to me, you know, pick one and it goes away. And, and it was, and, you know, it wasn't something great like Teresa of Avila or anything like that, but, you know, it was just kind of God letting me know, um, you know, even through my subconscious, maybe, yeah. I don't know, but, uh, you know, you really need to get back wow. with the program here. Um, but it really freaked me out. You know, I thought, oh, I didn't realize I had drifted so far from God. Hmm. I got so complacent, you know, um, and actually right before that had happened within, you know, a few months, I had broken up with this guy and had a very depressing time in my life and kind of, you know, spiraled downwards. And, uh, it was the lowest, darkest time in my life. And then this happened that made me realize how far away from God I had drifted. And so I went home and I, I prayed and I cried and I said, Oh God, I, this is not what I wanted, you know, to drift so far away from you. And, you know, what do I do? I, I've looked at all these denominations before. I don't know what to do or where to go. Um, and so I just prayed and I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to start going to church again, but I don't know where I'm going to go to church. <laughs> and then, uh, the next time I was at school, a classmate of mine who was fairly new to the area, it was like her first or second term. She asked me, Hey, do you want to go to church with me? <laughs> and I said, Oh, this is a sign from God. So I said, Oh yeah, definitely. Where do you want to go? And she said, well, I haven't picked a church yet. Where do you want to go? And I picked the Baptist church in town because it's the largest church in town. And I didn't want anybody to know that I was not a member because in my experience growing up, when you came in and you were a newbie, everybody knew and they came and said, Oh, are you saved or are you, you know, whatever. Right. And I didn't want that. I wanted to be completely incognito. So, um, I went to the Baptist church with her a couple times and she decided to go elsewhere. Um, she wanted that small church feeling and so we parted, but I kept going there. Uh, went there for about a year probably. Uh, and it was a really great church. I loved it, loved the people there, loved the pastor. Everybody was super nice. I just really enjoyed my time there. Um, so what you were drawn to was the fellowship and the worship and the music and the preaching and all that. You'd already gone through the theology a, a while back. Mm -hmm. and just check that off your list, but that probably wasn't as much up front. As yeah, I felt like at that point, I felt like I really need to um, just go to church and, yeah. and get something and God will lead me where God wants me to be. I don't know where that is yet, but he'll let me know. And uh I, I think I was probably more drawn to the fact that it was huge and nobody would know who I was. <laughs> but but then once I started going, everybody was amazingly wonderful, well, you know. So part of the family. Yeah. All right. Well, April, we're going to pause there and take our break. Leave you as a Baptist for a moment, and then we'll <laughs> come back in a little bit and pick you up on the journey. All right. Okay. See you later. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Uh, I'm Marcus Grody, your host, and our guest tonight is April Bright, former United Pentecostal. We paused in her journey. Um, as a, uh, did, they, did you have to get rebaptized? I did not get rebaptized in the Baptist church. Uh, I didn't want anybody to know that I wasn't Baptist, so, um, you know, eventually I came in contact with some of the, the people that were in charge of the different religious ministries and stuff. And they did want me to get rebaptized, but I knew that I couldn't get baptized there because I didn't believe all their theology. So right. I just politely declined every time it came up. Um, and so I did go there for about a year. And then, um, you know, eventually they discovered me. And <laughs> and uh, some some of them started pushing me to officially join, which I had no intention of doing. Yeah. And um, they were, you know, they had the best intentions and stuff, but I, I just couldn't do it. So I, I kind of pushed them off as long as I could. Um, and then the pastor started doing these sermons that uh, really brought back to me all the, the holes that I had had in my early doctrine and the issues that I had had. And so uh, 
he did a, a sermon, like a two-week sermon on how baptism was not necessary for salvation. And I just wasn't happy with that, I guess. You know, I was like, oh man, why do you have to talk about that? And then he did a, like a, you know, three or four week uh, sermon set on um, the inerrancy of scripture. And by the time that he got done with that, I was ready to never go back to that church <laughs> because uh, it, it really brought to mind the issue of authority. And, you yeah. know, a lot of converts have that issue and it had never really occurred to me before. But as he went on about how scripture is inerrant and everything that is supposed to be there is there and everything that's not supposed to be there is not there. And, and this is what you know, this means and this is what that means and whatever. I got to the point where I thought, I believe in the inerrancy of scripture 100%, but I don't believe what you're telling me about scripture is true because I don't believe, you know, once saved, always saved or that baptism isn't necessary. So I don't believe your version of inerrancy. Therefore, who says it's inerrant? I can't take this inerrancy from you because I don't believe what you're telling me. (laughs) And... (laughs) (laughs) It, you know, I think it was the Holy Spirit, honestly, because, you know, it, that, that wasn't his goal, obviously. Right. Um, but I started wondering, I, if I believe that it's inerrant, how do I know that the inerrant books are in the Bible, all of them? And how do I know that there are no errant ones in the Bible? Because where did the Bible come from and who decided that these are the books, you know? <laughs> and I believe that the right ones are inerrant, but how do I know? they're all together and where they should be, right? Um, And then, so between that and the pressure I was getting to officially join and get baptized, I just stopped going. So I had gone uh, for about a year probably. So this was um, probably about March of 2008 through, or maybe February through 2009. Uh, And so I, I just stopped going. And, um, I think, yeah, probably about February. So I stopped going and it was funny because right around Christmas of 2008, uh, I was having a conversation with this friend of mine from my teenage years who we had lost contact for a number of years and had gotten back in touch. And I discovered one day that he was Catholic, had never known he was Catholic, had no idea. (laughs) And I said to him, are you really Catholic? He said, yeah, what are you? (laughs) And I was like, oh gosh, I don't know. (laughs) What do I say, you know? And so I kind of, you know, stepped around the question a little bit and 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 it just really bothered me and it really got to me. And I said, I I prayed and I said, God, why did you save me from the edge of the precipice for this? Because I'm still wandering. I still don't know what it is. You promised me I'd know it when I found it. What do I do, you know? Um, And by that time, I was pretty convinced that there was no truth anymore. You know, I wanted 100% or nothing. I wanted the fullness or nothing, basically. It's kind of just my personality, I guess. But um, I just figured it's just been lost to the sands of time. It's just been too long. There's no such thing anymore. You know that conundrum that you pointed out in that Baptist pastor is really significant. If this Bible is inerrant and fallible and everything in there and yet what he's teaching, teaching, you know, isn't true mm-hmm. in his interpretation. That eventually undercuts everything. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. which, which interpretation? And I can see how that would lead exactly where it's led. <laughs> and we've heard about people that very, yeah. very are. You know. Yeah, it was... Hopefully you didn't lose Jesus. In the no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did not lose Jesus. In fact, um, it made me want to seek him more. But it, it did... Uh, depress me because I felt like I've spent, you know, all this time searching and I still haven't found, you know, when are you going to give it to me? Um, And I I think I did tell God, you know, you're going to have to give it to me soon or I don't know what's going to become of me because I can't just go on just searching blindly forever. So then, like I said, I got in touch with that friend and it was funny because I didn't talk to him again after that. Like, our communication just kind of disappeared, you know? <laughs> he dropped off the face of the earth. But um, for some reason, it made me curious about Catholicism. And not even from the standpoint of, hey, maybe this is for me, but more of it wasn't something that had ever been 
in my life, like because of growing up in Utah, had no idea what it was, none whatsoever. So it made me really curious. So I started researching it and then I discovered that I had EWTN and I started watching it. And I think the first program that I saw on EWTN was uh, The Rosary with Mother Angelica, and it confused me so much. I had no idea what was going on. You had no file folders in your head. Yeah, to put no it, clue. Understand. And the, you know, the description. It wasn't Mother, it was just the rosary, you know, all of that. Exactly. Right. Right. And on the description, on the cable, you know, you hit info or whatever, and it comes up on the screen, and it says Mother Angelica discusses the mysteries of the rosary. And I thought, oh, it'll tell me what a rosary is. No. <laughs> but then the next thing I discovered was um, at the time they were running catechism series and I thought, oh, this is great. I can find out what Catholics believe. Yeah. And he's, you know, he was funny and, and entertaining and just I enjoyed listening to him a lot. The next program I discovered was The Journey Home and I thought, oh, this is perfect. I can find out why people become <laughs> Catholic. This is awesome. Uh, and so I, I watched that religiously and was just amazed every time. Um, and then the, the next show that I discovered was on was Scott Hahn's Reasons to Believe. And because of my scriptural background, um, I knew what he was talking about. I didn't have to go get my Bible and look it up. I just, I knew yeah. what it was. And every single thing that he said, I was like, oh, that's what that means. Oh, oh my gosh. And it was like, my the holes that I had had in the doctrine or that I had felt that w existed as a, a child um, it was like a puzzle with pieces missing and every week when I would watch him it was like he was taking the puzzle pieces and putting them into my puzzle one by one <laughs> and um, so it was great because not only did I agree with it but he was like answering my questions you know he had the missing pieces but then it kind of scared me because at some point I was like oh <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is what I've been searching for all this time. And I had never been anti-Catholic. It just wasn't on my radar at all. But it kind of scared me because it was very different than what I had grown up in or any of the churches I had ever attended. Uh, but then one day um, I heard, well, there was two things. Once. Um, somebody was talking about the early church fathers and I had no idea who they were or that they even existed. I had thought my whole life that the Bible was all we had. Had no idea we had early Christian writings. And I thought, oh, that's great. That, that could help, you know. <laughs> and then somebody, and I can't remember if it was Scott Hahn's show or if it was something else you'd think I would remember, but they were talking about the early church fathers and they brought up St. Ignatius of Antioch. Now, by this time, I knew that Catholics believed in transubstantiation, but I had no idea why. And then he started quoting from, I think it was the letter to the Smyrnians. And I, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase here, but he basically said, we believe this because this is what was passed on to us. We believe that this is the body and blood of Christ. The disciples taught them that. Um, and the people that don't believe it are heretics. And I think my chin hit my chest and I just, I cannot believe this, right? I'm sitting there in awe and thinking, if this is true, I want this. So I went online immediately and looked it up and read it for myself and it said exactly what he had said it said. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, I want that, I have to have that. How can you be closer to Jesus than receiving him whole and complete, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I was just absolutely dumbfounded, you know, and I, um, I spent some time reading some other stuff about the Eucharist to try and figure out what this doctrine was and why and what exactly Catholics believe, you know. As a, just, I don't want to take away too much, but as a United Pentecostal, I assume that at least once a month or so you would have communion or ever? And it, um, it depends on the specific pastor. Okay. It's, um, some of them do it more often like that. Uh, some of them, I think our pastor did it once a year and it was only adults and... And it was just symbolic of them? You know, I think that they believe more along the lines of he's spiritually present okay, because they do Calvinist take it pretty, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. more like that. They do take it pretty seriously. Um, you know, when Paul said that you're eating, you know, eating and drinking damnation to yourself if you, you know, yeah. eat, do unworthily. They do believe in that. So I'm not, I never was really privy to that because I was never an adult 
going there, so I never received it. So I'm not completely sure, to be quite honest. Okay. But at this time, you're just reading Ignatius of Antioch and other things on the internet, maybe watching a little bit of EWTN. Mm -hmm. You haven't stepped foot yet in a Catholic church. No, I hadn't. I, <laughs> I had seen <laughs> mass on EWTN. But once I discovered the Eucharist, I thought, I have to have that. I want that, you know? So I, but I thought, okay, but before I do this, I have to know everything that these people teach because I have to know if I can believe it or not. <laughs> and, you know, it, it kind of makes me laugh now because now my view is, you know, the truth is objective. You conform yourself to the truth, not do I believe this? Is it true for me? So, <laughs> but I got the, the catechism, the big green one, and I read it. I just poured over it, read it in probably a, a week because that was how badly I wanted to know what do Catholics believe, you know? And as soon as I was done reading it, uh, I looked in the phone book to find a Catholic church close to me, and I called him up and I said, I want to make an appointment with a priest. I want to be Catholic. And <laughs> I'm guessing that doesn't happen a lot because <laughs> um, when the, the lady who answered the phone, she had just a mild surprise in her voice. I mean, I'm sure people call and ask about RCIA, but I had no idea it existed right, at the right. time. Or so. what it meant, what, what, the, what the letters mean. <laughs> yeah, and so it wasn't, hey, what do I do to become Catholic? It was, I want to talk to a priest. And so <laughs> I got um, I got together with the, the priest. We had a nice, very long meeting, and I told him, you know, my story, and I told him, so by this point, I, <laughs> It was right after Easter in that year. So I had been researching the Catholic Church f since maybe February, and then Easter was in like the middle of April that year. So it was only a few months. So for me, it was extremely overwhelming because I found out all this stuff like really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it kind of um, felt like, I like to make the joke that, you know, when St. Paul was knocked off of his donkey, right? I wasn't out bashing the church, but I kind of like to make the joke that, that I was on my donkey and I was going along and then I got, you know, knocked off my donkey with a lead pipe because it, to me, it felt like being hit by a freight train because it was this unbelievably yeah. huge, amazing, like, I couldn't even put it into words. Mm. It just was an overnight 180 degrees practically. And so, um, I spoke with the priest at length and he told me, I can tell that you've really done your research. <laughs> I'm not going to make you go to RCIA because honestly, as far as doctrine goes, you're not going to learn a whole lot because you've already researched so much, but I'm going to highly recommend that you go because if I were to send you into mass right now, you'd have no idea what was going on. You wouldn't know anybody, you know, you wouldn't know what it means to be a Catholic. I said, whatever, sign me up. I want to go right now. <laughs> so I had to wait, you know, about five months before it started and then I had to wait you know until the next Easter so I ha by the time I decided uh, you know I had to wait a full year before I could have the Eucharist and that was really hard so I would go um, I started going to started, mass yeah. and he gave me so because on EWTN parts of the mass are in Latin I was really confused when I went so he gave me a book that details the parts of mass and the responses and you know so that was really helpful um, the first time I went, I was scared to death because I just had no idea what was going to happen. I didn't know what to do, you know. Um, I was afraid I was going to make myself look like an idiot. <laughs> it was a very daunting uh, experience, I think. But um, I, the only thing that, the, <laughs> that actually happened to me that first time was during the Kiss of Peace. I did not know that I was supposed to say, peace be with you. I said, oh, thanks. <laughs> Okay. So it was, you know, it was <laughs> kind of fun, but Innocent? yeah, yeah. and and the girl said to me, oh, you're new, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, you know, I went through the RCIA process, which was amazing. Mm. Um, our director of evangelization there is a wonderful woman and she teaches doctrine really well. And we got to you know, I got to go through it with other people who were in kind of my same boat and get gradually introduced to the church and, you know, the life of the church. So it was one thing to kind of have the, the head knowledge, but right. a whole other thing to actually be You're becoming a, a part of the body of Christ. Yeah. So it's, it's family. There's yeah. a lot there. Yep. And that's a big part of what RCI is intended to 
Yeah, to do it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. I loved it. Um, and so one of the things that everybody always asks me is, you know, Mary, was Mary right. an issue for you? And Mary was not an issue for me. And I think, you know, I don't know. I just, she just wasn't. Yeah. It was interesting. When I read the catechism, everything that it said about her, I was like, oh yeah, that's either I believed it already or I thought, sure, why not? You know, Mary's assumption. Yeah. Elijah was assumed. Why can't Mary be assumed? I have no problem with that, you know. Um, the only thing that I ever had a question about when it came to Mary was mediatrix of all graces. <laughs> and it took me until probably a, a year and a half after I became Catholic to really kind of put that to bed. But I, at that point, I said, well, the, I believe everything else the church says. I believe she's right on everything else. She must be right on this, so I'm just going to set it aside and in faith know that I will eventually understand this. And eventually I did, and it just came to me. Well, she said yes. She mediated all graces to us by saying yes. If yeah. she had not said yes, where would we be? Right. Yeah, it, it basically affirms her essential part in salvation history. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she's just not an add-on. Uh, or sadly, as many of, of us Protestants treated her like she was a surrogate mother of some sort. You know, yeah. God used her for a little bit and that was it. No, she was an integral part all along. Mm -hmm. And that's really what all of that affirms. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering, like other, like communion of saints is almost a, also one that was not comfortable for, uh, for many I, because you're praying to the dead people, some <laughs> would say, you know, yeah. how do you do that? You know? I actually never had an issue with that. I, I think uh, without knowing that the communion of saints per se existed, I always believed in it my entire life. So uh, when I was a small child, I would talk to my dead grandparents and, and other people who had died just knowing that because they were in heaven, they could hear me. That's not what the church that I grew up in teaches. They teach uh, basically that you're asleep in God until the end yeah. and that at that point, you know, you're at the resurrection, then you are awake again. So they don't believe that you know anything that's going on in that period of time. But I always believed that they did, and I don't have any idea where that came from. But so for another, me... Another work of grace. Yeah, yeah, I guess it must have been. For me, it was kind of, um, you know, praying to a saint, asking them to pray for me. It just seemed natural. Yeah. You know, I think uh, a lot of people mistake it and think that we pray to saints or Mary as in like we worship them the way we worship God. But uh, I think just loving yeah. the English language and having studied it a lot, by the time that I got to that point, I already knew that the word has more than one meaning, you know? Yeah. So it never was Well, of course, you came from a Pentecostal background where your worship, singing, prayer, speaking, Mm -hmm. All of that, but there was no sacrifice. Right. See, traditional worship involves sacrifice, mm -hmm. our Lord in, in the altar. Uh, so if you don't have sacrifice, then worship is just prayer and talking. Mm -hmm. So if that's what you're doing to the saints, it seems kind of like worship because that's what we do. Right. But they don't recognize that no authentic worship involves sacrifice. That's the continuity, and we see it in the in the Mass and the, and the Eucharist. Yeah. Uh, did you have to get rebaptized? I did, actually, yeah. Not um, really rebaptized, well. <laughs> but baptized for the first time, right? Yeah, I got uh, baptized. I got all three sacraments at Easter Vigil in 2010. Uh, that was a very overwhelming amount of grace to receive in one night. <laughs> <laughs> I had several people ask me if, if my head came out of the clouds at all during that evening. But um, it was it was a, such a wonderful, amazing experience. and. Ew. <laughs> just receiving the Eucharist for the first time, I can't even put that into words. I mean, I think I was really nervous to even do so. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I, I don't really like large crowds of people staring at me anyway. So <laughs> that was a little nerve wracking, you know, because the, the church was packed. It was absolutely packed. And that year we had a, a small group. So I was the only catechumen. So during every rite all year, it was, you know, do you April, you know, instead of like, do you catechumens, yeah. you know? And so it was, it w there was me and then there was two other people who were um, not catechumens. Uh, but 
it was super overwhelming in that sense because I, I had everybody really focused on me. And then of course, uh, we had the, the priest giving the Eucharist and the deacon had the chalice. And I was so used to going the other direction that I went the other direction and I was like, later I was like, oh no, I promise I wasn't, you know, avoiding you. <laughs> I went to the other minister and uh, so I, it took me a while, I think, to adjust to sure. being Catholic, you know, because it was such a, a transformative event that was so different than anything I had ever experienced. But every, every single time I go to mass, there's this part inside of me that says, yay, I'm Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> Do you say that when you have to go to confession? You know, a confession, <laughs> maybe after. <laughs> it has been, a confession has been a huge grace for me. Um, I was scared to death of that the first time too, because it was completely different. I didn't know how to do it or what to say exactly. I mean, I told the priest, hey, I've never done this before. You gotta help me. But um, I feel so at peace every time that I go. Every, every single time, I just have this amazing, wonderful feeling of, peace and joy and love and it, it's the most amazing thing that I can I can't even put it into words really you know when you think about the scriptures that say that when the big day comes and we stand before God we'll be held accountable for our lives mm -hmm. scriptures say that all over the place um, from a Catholic perspective one of the beauties is that all the, so much of it has been wiped clean all along mm -hmm. You know, it's been wiped clean. It's been forgiven. We know that. As a Protestant, I would say, well, you know, I just point to Jesus and his righteousness covers me. Mm -hmm. So God doesn't see my sins. Well, that's my particular brand. of. But the, the beauty of the confessional is a gift that our Lord gave the apostles in John 20, mm -hmm. which was one of the greatest things, sadly, that so much of Christianity has, has set aside. We have an email. Let's see if we can get one in. Morgan from San Jose writes, I am a lifelong evangelical and want to follow Jesus as best I can. Someone recently pointed out to me, though, that Jesus founded one church and that is the Catholic Church. I've definitely been searching for more in my walk with Jesus and I'm curious if I should explore Catholicism. What are some reasons why someone like me should consider the Catholic faith? <laughs> oh, there's too many to list, but I think... Uh, I really think, for, for me, obviously, the Eucharist was a huge deal. I mean, I know it, it isn't the hinge pin for everybody, but I really wanted to have the deepest, closest relationship with Jesus that I possibly could. That had been my lifelong goal. And so when I discovered it and discovered that it's not just some man-made thing, I mean, Jesus said it, John records it in his gospel, and yeah. Ignatius, who was a disciple of John, right says, hey, yeah, this is what we were taught, you know, and so he's only the second degree away from him. I, to me, that was the biggest thing. I couldn't imagine knowing that that existed and not being a part of it, you know, and, and when I had been a Protestant, John chapter six was so confusing to me. I thought they must have thought he was nuts. And, you know, obviously they did, but I could not figure it out. So when I heard that the first time, it just all kind of fell into place. Yeah, the, uh, that John chapter 6, and this is to our, our emailer. Mm -hmm. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And it goes on mm -hmm. many times. I mean, how do you deal with that? Exactly. How do you deal with that? And groups like the you know, Pentecostals will take certain verses and lift those up as definitive. You've got to speak in tongues because mm -hmm. it says it here. And they take it literally. Well, what about that? Yeah. What about those verses? Yep. yep. It's, it is, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I know I've heard you on this show speak about the, the verses that you missed as a Protestant yeah. uh, many times. But for me, it was kind of, instead of missing verses, it was what does this mean? <laughs> and so when I became Catholic, it was like all the answers to every question I ever had were answered. I mean, you know, I mean, there are things that are mysteries and stuff, but, but all these questions, like I had wondered for years, what does it mean? And so it was really great to find out. <laughs> yeah, 
Well, thank you for your witness. Yeah. Uh, you, you've been happy home? Oh, yes. I love being Catholic. It's the best decision I've ever made in my whole life. <laughs> thank, I thank God every day for bringing me home to the Catholic Church. All right. Well, thank you for your witness, thank April. You. Thank you for joining us on the, on the journey home. And our prayers go with you as you continue to live out your faith. And we know the struggles, but we're all in this together. That's the beauty. That's why RCIA is about reminding us that we're all in this together. Yes. It's not just, it's not just April, week after week, up in front <laughs> of the church. It's all of us yeah. together. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that April's journey is an encouragement to you to appreciate the great gifts that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ and the church that he gave us so that we might have life and have it abundantly. God bless you. See you next week.